Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Bernardo, Dean of UCLA Anderson School of Management, and I'd like to welcome you to this event, the dynamic role of technology, business, and government and society hosted by the centers at Anderson. Our centers at Anderson act as hubs for leadership insights, faculty research, student and alumni engagement, and service to our communities and society. Our centers operate in areas such as finance, real estate, entrepreneurship, technology, media and entertainment, marketing analytics, and global affairs. Today's discussion is the first in a series created by our centers, collaborating in an effort to share expertise, learnings, and best practices across all disciplines, to bring greater awareness of the problems and opportunities in the world around us, and to develop new paradigms for effective leadership. We live in a world today with huge opportunities and challenges in every sector. We see the benefits of technology as an enabler to dealing with challenging issues such as COVID-19. We see changes in the fundamental place of where we shop, are educated and entertained. We see notable best practices from abroad and across all areas. We also see leadership challenges which require an ability to conceive of new solutions, new business models, and new modes of engaging with employees in our communities. We believe the solutions are fundamentally interdisciplinary, cross-center and cross-campus with a greater focus on the communities we serve and the society we are a part of. Tonight's program on the role of technology, business and government, I believe is a great example of the spirit of this collective effort. I hope you engage in this program, learn from it, and ultimately lead in a way that benefits you, your organizations, our communities and society at large. So please let me now introduce Terry Kramer, faculty director of our UCLA Anderson Easton Technology Management Center, who will be moderating tonight's program. Terry? Tony, a, a big thank you. And let me first of all, just start out and thank you for your own leadership on this, really advancing our work at understanding changing leadership paradigms, all of this in collaboration with the centers at, uh, at Anderson. And I hope all of you will find that this is gonna be a very engaging and timely discussion here about this intersection between technology and business and government and their roles in serving society and, uh, and beyond. Now, obviously, when you look at technology, it has an amazing impact in many areas of our lives, whether for all of us as consumers, as business people, or as part of a broader uh, society. It's allowed, in many cases, better outcomes, lower costs in areas like healthcare, in transportation, and education. But also at the same time, it's created more and more of a tech lash recently, a growing set of concerns about tech companies and their products and services. And whether this is manifest in terms of data privacy concerns, antitrust concerns, a growing digital divide and income divide, or concerns about the future of work more broadly. And so in this discussion, we're gonna talk about the fundamental role of leadership amidst all of these issues. What is the role of a CEO in this environment? What is the role of government? What is the role of business in relation to government? Now, in looking at all of these interesting issues, I can't think of a better speaker than Congressman Ro Khanna. His congressional district serves the Silicon Valley and his unique role in Congress operates at this epicenter or vortex about how to really use technology and how to think about the role of business and government in ensuring strong outcomes. And to understand why he's been so skilled in his role, all you have to do is look at his background. His parents were Indian immigrants to the US. His father was a chemical engineer from IIT. His mother was a substitute school teacher. His maternal grandfather was part of India's independence movement and spent several years in jail in pursuit of human rights and freedom. The congressman, along with the now late Congressman John Lewis, wrote an op-ed in the Boston Globe that exa examined how Gandhi's movement was intertwined with the civil rights movement here in the US. The congressman received his bachelor's degree in economics with honors from the University of Chicago. He received his law degree from Yale, specializing in intellectual property law. He's worked for more than one prominent law firm, including Wilson Sonsini, representing technology companies on a variety of issues, including IP protection. 
He was a deputy assistant secretary in the U.S. Department of Commerce in the Obama administration, leading international trade missions and supporting U.S. exports. He was later appointed to the White House Business Council by President Trump. At the same time, the congressman has authored the Internet Bill of Rights in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica breach and Mark Zuckerberg's testimony to Congress. He's challenged Silicon Valley executives and technology companies to do more nationwide to create tech jobs and to, to diversify their recruiting efforts and to offer a vision for how all Americans can benefit regardless of their uh, location geographically in a tech-driven economy. He's pursued antitrust policy and scrutinized the Whole Foods Amazon merger. Now with that great background, let me formally welcome Congressman Ro Khanna. It's a pleasure to have you here. Well, Terry, thank you. Uh, thank you for such a, uh, a detailed uh, introduction and substantive introduction. And thank you, Tony, uh, as well for inviting me. I'm really uh, amazed by uh, the entire series that you're going to be having at the intersection of technology, which I view as sort of the substratum of society and impacting so many aspects of uh, our world uh, and looking at what impact that's having on policy and business. Uh, it is a under discussed uh, issue uh, and having effective uh, leadership uh, on this is going to be uh, critical. Uh, so I know we're, we're, we're going to be doing a, a conversation and uh, uh, I look forward to, to participating and uh, uh, engaging with everyone. Excellent, excellent. So I am, as, as the Congressman alluded to, I'm going to ask a series of questions to get a better understanding of the Congressman's view on these issues, recommendations. We'll then go to Slido for a moderated Q&A discussion. As a reminder, the Slido event code is 86578, and you can enter in your own question or you can upvote one of the existing uh, ones that have already been uh, posted, and then I'll endeavor to uh, have uh, the most popular questions uh, posed to the Congressman. So Congressman, let me just start out very, very broadly. What is your view about the state of technology today? I mean, what, what areas are you most excited about? What areas of innovation do you think are most promising, and which ones do you think will help society most broadly? Well, I believe the uh, pace of innovation in, in technology is in many ways remarkable. I mean, you have uh, the opportunities to have major uh, medical advances uh, as we figure out through uh, AI and other technologies how we can personalize treatment for medicine. Uh, we have to, one has to be uh, amazed by how much progress has actually been made on uh, coronavirus as quickly as we have in terms of as far as we are along uh, on vaccine development uh, uh, on some therapeutics. Now, obviously, everyone wants it even faster, but it's remarkable uh, how much has been done. The uh, information explosion and uh, the fact that most people now have uh, so much uh, information uh, and knowledge at their fingertips, I think, is going to uh, continue uh, to take place. And we were talking even before the session about how uh, people now may have access to the greatest thinkers uh, uh, of the world and, and, and their seminars, their conversations uh, could be online so that you no longer have knowledge uh, as just the domain of the elite, just uh, folks who went to UCLA or Yale. Uh, you actually may have uh, that be accessible to, to, to many, many people. And of course, then you've had the driving down of consumer prices. And in a way, uh, our economy, of course, is pr uh, probably overly so privileged consumerism over job creation. So those are all the benefits. But obviously, there are huge concerns. The concern is what is this doing in terms of uh, displacing and driving out of business small retailers? What is it doing in terms of uh, fragmenting our democracy? And uh, what is it doing in terms of our intellectual uh, uh, freedoms in terms of our privacy and our ability to think without being manipulated online. Uh, what is it doing uh, when it comes to uh, places that have been left out, uh, where, which have seen manufacturing leave and haven't seen new industry come? So I think that the, the, what I would say is technology, we're at the precipice. There's extraordinary potential for good, uh, but it has also uh, aggravated a lot of divides. 
And let me ask if you would to drill down on a couple things today. So COVID-19, obviously the, the death toll is getting worse and worse. The U.S. does not look good in any measure uh, across the world. Um, when you look at racial injustices that continue to this day, tell us about your view about technology in relation to those items. Do you believe technology is part of the solution fundamentally, um, or do you believe it's been part of the problem that's kind of led to this situation? Well, I think they're, they're two different uh, issues. On COVID-19, I believe science and technology are part of the solution. I think we've had that, uh, unfortunately, uh, some evidence-free uh, policy making. I mean, I was looking back in, in 1918 when we had the Spanish flu, there were apparently anti-masking clubs that emerged back then. Unfortunately, 600,000 Americans died, which would be the equivalent of 2 million today. And we have anti-masking clubs today. I mean, basically a modern day rejection of, uh, of scientific expertise. I think it raises a broader question, which is how do we Everyone says, let's rely on the scientists, let's rely on the experts, but I think that's uh, too easy. I think the deeper question is, how do we get science to relate to people's anxieties, aspirations, and goals in a democratic society? Uh, how do we uh, make people feel empowered to participate in uh, accepting, embracing uh, scientific uh, recommendations? Other countries have done this in part because of the experience of SARS, and they uh, had a a reflective moment uh, when you look at South Korea or Taiwan about what lessons they could learn and how they could build a culture to prevent that. And I think one lesson for us in this pandemic, after the pandemic, is how can we, in a depoliticized way, figure out uh, to build some consensus for adopting scientific recommendations the next time without politicizing them. I also think we need far more investment in our public health infrastructure, where uh, we invest less than 1% of our defense budget in public health, in the NIH and uh, in uh, CDC, and our testing would have been much better had the public CDC been more uh, well-funded. Uh, we would have had much more vaccine research uh, for coronavirus, which was often discontinued in 2007 uh, because it wasn't a, seen as an impending risk uh, if we had more funding. And finally, I think technology uh, needs to navigate uh, what we can do with contact tracing and uh, understanding data without crossing the line like some other countries have uh, in terms of not caring about civil liberties. I mean, in our country, we, I think it's a good thing that we care about privacy and civil liberties. We don't want uh, either the government or uh, big tech uh, figuring out if I were to go outside my house without a mask, which I wouldn't do, but I don't think that my phone should alert the police to have me uh, arrested. And uh, some of the other countries have a different... Uh, a balance on that. So how do we construct technology in ways that can protect privacy to tackle that? So that's the answer on, on coronavirus. Race, I think, is a much d different issue, a deeper issue where I think technology has not uh, done that well. I think if we want to uh, democratize access to uh, the innovation economy, uh, we have to have more people in leadership and more people employed in these platforms. I mean, the Reality is the racial wealth gap has increased over the last three decades, and large parts of uh, uh, minority communities are unrepresented in uh, in tech companies. They are not at the uh, place where these platforms are being designed. Uh, and so I, uh, yes, on a superficial level, it was an iPhone that captured the George Floyd uh, killing. Uh, but the question is, how, how can tech uh, learn about creating more uh, equity uh, and, and diversity uh, within our uh, own ecosystem, uh, understanding how Im important it is, is in shaping the future of the economy and society. Yep. Let me now ask you, Congressman, because you've touched on some of the tech lash issues here. How is it in, in uh, just a few days ago, the four leading tech CEOs testified uh, uh, to Congress how is it that the tech lash issues have become so dominant today? Is it because of what Eric Schmidt had said a few weeks ago saying, well, you know, there's more and more adoption of technology. So by definition, you're gonna get more and more people that are gonna have some issue with it. In addition to liking it, they're not gonna like some things. And how much of it is there have been missteps 
uh, things that the technology companies should have done to have better manage what would have been these impending tech lash issues? Well, I, I mean, obviously, I mean, on a very basic level, Schmidt is right. I mean, when you have more technology, people are going to have more opinions on it. But I think uh, it's deeper than that. I, I think what people are uh, fearing is uh, change in, in a very profound way uh, and, and, and in some ways a, a loss of control uh, over their own lives, over their own communities, over their own ability to be effective citizens over their own ability to have their own businesses. And if you are uh, controlling or participating in the creation of technology, then uh, it is deeply empowering. You are able to build new platforms, create new wealth, uh, help innovate. Uh, if you are outside, then you are felt acted upon and not participating in the action. And so I think that the reaction to tech in many ways is a assertion of people's own dignity, their own autonomy, their sense of, I want to keep, take control over, over my life. And the question then becomes, how do we uh, become nuanced about it? I mean, you don't want to lose all of the benefits and you don't want to just say, okay, we're going to lose any economy of scale, we're going to lose any innovation, but you want to make sure that you have some, uh, some remedy for the newspapers that are going out of business, for retailers that are going out of business. So let me give you one very concrete suggestion, which will tell you where I come from. Some people are saying, let's just ban all targeted advertisement. Uh, I, don't, I think that's going too far. I mean, I think if someone wants to have tag targeted advertisements uh, to say, uh, you know, uh, Rokana is speaking, and if you're interested in Silicon Valley or technology, come in here and speak, uh, you know, you probably don't need that going to the whole country. I mean, you probably need that going to Anderson at, 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 at UCLA. Uh, but the question I think is, okay, let's make sure you're opting in uh, before uh, someone is getting your data. So UCLA shouldn't just be able to get, or uh, Terry, you shouldn't just be able to get people's data without them knowing and send them advertisements about me uh, speaking. Uh, and secondly, uh, you know, for the newspapers, I mean, if people are now uh, not reading newspapers because Google and Facebook are accumulating so much of the ad revenue, maybe there's a tax in a separate fund to fund local journalism uh, that comes out of that revenue. That's, you know, I'm not wedded to that, that idea, but it's in a sense of the way I would approach these things, which is how do we find appropriate, well-crafted regulation and balance uh, that allows for innovation, but uh, takes care of some of the displacement. And let me ask you now the next level down on this, Congressman, when you look at all the tech lash issues, and again, if I would put out there data privacy, antitrust issues, digital divide, future of work. If you were to rank order, which ones you're most concerned about today, which ones would it be? I would say the digital divide because everything else I think stems from that. Imagine uh, if uh, you had a robust uh, uh, industry of technology and Facebook or Twitter jobs in uh, uh, rural red states. It would probably be harder for Trump to accuse those companies of being biased. Uh, if you had more people participating in the creation of the algorithms, you probably would have less of a sense that their people's data is being uh, manipulated. Uh, if you had a more distributed benefits of technology, uh, you would have uh, a more of a sense that it's fueling local economies instead of displacing local economies. So I think the first order of business, in my view, is to expand access to innovation uh, so that more communities, more people, uh, feel like they are uh, the architects of the uh, modern in, uh, infrastructure. Once they're doing that, then I think you would have more consensus on how do we deal with uh, antitrust, how do we deal with uh, issues of privacy, how do we deal with issues of bias, how do we determine what stays on a platform and what doesn't. It will not be perfect, but at least people will feel represented. Okay. Is, the, is it fair to say, Congressman, that there's a bit of a quid pro quo or a trade-off? What I mean by that is if the large tech companies could do an even better job of providing access, digital access, then there's an argument to allow them to get more scale. Or watch what you're equivocating here on. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I would say a couple of things to that. First of all, I think most people are probably not going to get to work for Apple and Google and Microsoft, but they may end up creating uh, 
many other jobs. I mean, there are a lot of companies that are going to require building their own tech platforms or Google, Microsoft may need tech services and a lot of Fortune 500, almost every company is gonna have a tech component to it. So uh, just because you're democratizing access to the innovation economy doesn't mean uh, everyone has to go work for one of the five uh, big tech companies. The second thing I would say is if these companies are expanding legitimately, uh, then I don't have a problem. But if they're expanding because they're undercutting competitors by artificially lowering prices or copying competitors in ways that are violating uh, their, uh, their copyright or their IP, or if they're merging in ways with competitors uh, that, they, that antitrust law shouldn't allow, then we should be uh, regulating that. Uh, and, uh, and making sure that there's large competition uh, in, in, this, in this space. So uh, I think we need to do both. We need these companies to, to diversify, uh, but that's not gonna be enough to, to have a footprint of technology uh, everywhere. Yep, excellent, very, uh, very helpful. And on that topic, who owns regulation? So on one extreme, it seems like you have leaders like Microsoft's president that said, you know what, regulate us because there's no other solution here that's gonna get, keep everybody happy. The other argument says, you know what, that, that's a bit of a cop out, that businesses should regulate themselves. They should be well-meaning, good behavior, all of that stuff. Where, where's your view about where regulation should happen here? Well, we definitely need Congress to act. I mean, we need Congress to regulate, but self-regulation hasn't worked. I mean, there have been, privacy violations, there have been antitrust violations, there have been uh, the, the diversity hiring isn't good, rural America uh, has been left out. So I think Congress has to, uh, has to act with certain concrete things, like have an opt-in law on, on data. I, I have said, uh, you know, which, which isn't the case, California's law is opt-out and to GDPR is opt-out. Uh, let's have an opt-in. You can't get data until uh, someone affirmatively consents. That's something Congress uh, should pass. Uh, economically, we could say, look, if you want a federal contract, have 10% of your workforce be in rural America or have 10% of your workforce be uh, Black or Latinx or have a certain amount of uh, women in your leadership. Uh, and those kind of incentives would, uh, would, would really uh, accelerate the uh, diversification, which the studies show is in the company's economic interests. But what happens, as you know, there is you know, you're a startup founder and you're so focused on just uh, not running out of uh, uh, money and crossing the valley of death that you end up doing things that perpetuate your own biases because it's easiest. And then that becomes a company culture. So while diversity may be uh, in the long-term interest, it's often not in the short-term interest. And that's where I think policy can incentivize uh, long-term long -term interest. Finally, I would say that it has to be in collaboration with the private sector. I mean, having the uh, federal government uh, work uh, with universities or land-grant universities or community colleges to set up programs of credentialing without consulting the boot camps or the tech companies about what the actual needs are is going to lead to ineffective credentials and a, a sense of actually uh, demotivating people from, from pursuing that. So I think the regulations and the programs have to be very much in collaboration. So uh, related to all this, what is in the art of the possible for what leaders should do for the future? So we're obviously at a, at a business school, we are turning out future leaders. Is it naive to assume that the next generation of leaders can uh, take actions and think about communities and think about product and think about diversity, et cetera, et cetera, that would allow them not to have to have Congress take action. Or, you know, that is realistic to expect and we need to get on with it. Well, I think that they could take action. I think they should think of themselves as leaders as two things, as leaders of a business and also as citizens, as citizens of their community, as citizens of the nation, uh, as, as, as Americans who have some uh, a moral obligation to, to communities around the world. And so uh, as, you look, as they look at themselves in that light, uh, then I think the question is what can they do uh, concretely to address uh, some of the challenges that we face uh, with the development of technology, just like we did with the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution did a lot of good, but it took 
uh, a lot of democratization of it uh, before it benefited the working class and before it benefited uh, uh, places that have been left out. So what can they do to, to drive this, this change? And I would say uh, both in how they are within their own companies or their own startups, and also uh, having some engagement uh, with public policy, because we are definitely going to need a whole new set of laws and regulations and policy uh, for uh, a technology age. And it's much better that they participate actively in shaping that than to disengage and then have people who may not know as much end up driving that policy. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. The business roundtable uh, must have been a year ago, not quite a year ago, talked about an expanding role of the CEO, serving a, a greater number of stakeholders. Do you fundamentally believe um, that is doable and it's the right path? Or do you feel it kind of, it sounds good, but it's going to be difficult to make all that happen? Well, I think it's, no, I definitely think it's a step in the right and I mean, as, as you know, we give corporations a lot of benefit. Uh, we limit the liability on a corporation. You can't go after uh, a, a corporation's uh, investors personally. We give corporations the benefits of how they uh, raise money. So it's, it's legitimate to expect that the corporation uh, has some reciprocal obligation uh, to the community or to a nation. And a CEO uh, has multiple stakeholders. And while, of course, you don't want them to disregard shareholders, I mean, a, venture, a company does have to make a profit, that does not mean that uh, quarterly bottom line profit maximization at the expense of everything else uh, is right for the country, nor does it mean that it's right long term uh, for the corporation itself. So I, uh, you know, I think, I mean, you're familiar, Leo Strain has done work on short termism, a Delaware uh, Supreme Court justice, and I I think that business leaders should think about uh, what is their responsibility to grow these institutions in ways that are going to allow America to succeed for the long run. Good. Let me uh, now get into the next topic, which is the idea about technology companies amidst a global competitive landscape, and specifically uh, with Chinese companies and the competition that, that may exist. We had Tom Wheeler here a few weeks ago, former FCC uh, yeah. chair, who talked a lot about a new policy proposal that he's made that basically says, you know what, there's too much conversation about the U.S. versus China, and the argument kind of goes, you need to allow more and more scale of the big U.S. tech companies because they're competing with Chinese companies that have larger domestic market, larger access to a global uh, 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 marketplace. He says, you know, that's a misguided thought. If we had more competition within the U.S., we would out-innovate everybody that's out there and said, listen, we need to create more of an environment where the, the data assets, the oil of the future, the data assets in the U.S. are shared with a lot of small, innovative entrepreneurial companies. And if we did that, that things are going to work out okay. And don't buy into this economist or Michael Porter argument that you need scale and data. And if you don't do that, you're subscale, you're inferior, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you come out on that broad view about competition with China, Tom Wheeler's view, uh, et cetera? Well, I have a lot of respect for Tom Wheeler, and I certainly think I'm intrigued by his proposal of allowing small businesses or startups to be able to have access to data. I mean, I think we have to be careful about it to make sure that that data is safeguarded and not uh, subject to breach. And anytime you have data going to more people or more entities, that becomes a risk, and you have to make sure that the data uh, isn't uh, uh, being uh, sold in ways that is actually incentivizing more collection and that there's consent, uh, but uh, giving certain small businesses some access to, to, to data, I think is a good idea to level the competitive playing field. I don't think that uh, is enough to compete with, with China. I mean, first, some things like artificial intelligence where you need to detect patterns do require uh, large amounts of, of data. Uh, the other thing is that our public investment in science and technology has declined. We're only at 0.6% of our GDP. Uh, Senator Schumer and I have a bill, the Endless Frontier Act, uh, with uh, Mike Gallagher and Senator Young to increase that to 1% uh, of GDP. Uh, China is pouring in uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in their investment in these technologies. Uh, our uh, private companies are making up, in some sense, for that gap. I mean, the 
uh, the, the scale of research is being done with some of these private companies. So uh, we want where I think that the uh, companies are, are are competing is in the investments on uh, science and technology. And what I think is needed, and so we're not as dependent uh, on large companies as for having the federal government uh, invest more in uh, cutting edge uh, research uh, and, and development. Excellent. Excellent. Makes sense. Let me ask you one last question. And then we've got a lot of questions that came in on Slido that I want to pose to you. The last question I've got for you specifically in this section is a more personal leadership question. Um, you are, are in a district and have a background and deal with a variety of issues that are very disparate. And in one sense, you could say they're very opposing. You know, in some positions, some people in the tech companies in your district, I would think, would feel, wait a minute, back off. I'm doing X, Y, and Z. The other side is you have people in your district that need uh, uh, issues in an environment where there's unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. Tell us as kind of a hybrid business person, hybrid elected official, how do you balance all of these perspectives and say, this is the direction I want to go? Well, I have a uh, vision. I call myself a progressive uh, capitalist. I have a vision that we need to marry innovation with egalitarian principles. In other words, I think that innovation can be a force for empowering people, giving people more of a voice in democracy, giving people more opportunity uh, to create wealth, giving people more opportunity uh, uh, to have uh, access to their dreams, uh, but that we have let too much the development of technology just be led by uh, the invisible hand and self-interest, and we haven't really applied uh, egalitarian principles or principles of, uh, of justice to uh, how an innovation economy should develop with concern for the workers with concern for who's being left out, with concern for whether consumers are being manipulated. So I think ultimately uh, the key in my view is uh, not to uh, squelch innovation, not to squelch entrepreneurship, not to demonize it, but to figure out how do we democratize it? How do we uh, have more people empowered by it? And that balance obviously is uh, always one that uh, you can be overplay one side or the other, and I certainly haven't been perfect, uh, but that is sort of my, uh, my worldview, and with that uh, uh, is how I approach issues in my district uh, that uh, have different sides. Excellent. Let me ask the first question. I got 13 up votes, so a lot of interest in this. Um, how uh, do we as a society monitor what is actually factual and what is false when it's coming from public servants and officials in this age of information? Well, it's a very difficult question. You know, I mean, I wouldn't trust uh, Jürgen Habermas or the late John Rawls to tell us what is truth and what is not, let alone to trust Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, not, no offense to them, but these are questions of deep uh, philosophy. I mean, how do we know what is in, true, what is not true, what is information, what is not information? So what, where do we go and how do we construct things? I, I, I think what uh, we have to have a few, few areas. One, uh, the more competition we have here, I think the better. I mean, it'd be better if we don't have uh, one or two platforms controlling the entire conversation on news. I mean, so we saw this with the television. We don't just have one or two television stations. We have a lot of them and we have a lot of different uh, channels. I think if we have more competition in uh, in social media space eventually because of the portability of data or other things, we may see that we're not as uh, reliant on uh, uh, just uh, a few people making decisions. Of course, the flip side of that is it may further polarize our conversation. Uh, you may sort of have conservative social media and liberal social media. So then the second thing I think is, well, how can these platforms create perhaps some uh, vetted content that um, uh, maybe they uh, consult with NBC and Fox News and Wall Street Journal and New York Times and Washington Post and Breitbart and HuffPost and create a panel of folks that says, here are, here are certain clips of alternative perspectives uh, and then try to feed that to, to people so people know that uh, there is some uh, sense of uh, uh, vetting that has taken place in a certain content. Uh, and, and they need to be thoughtful about what they're amplifying and not necessarily just amplify things based on engagement. But these are very difficult questions. What I will say is that 
the answer that this is just free speech uh, doesn't cut it. I mean, that's sort of what you write and, you know, you're, uh, it wouldn't get you a passing grade in first year college or something. I mean, there are a lot of types of speech that aren't allowed in the United States, like shouting fire at a theater or illegal conduct or incitement to violence. So we, we can't have tech leaders just say, well, that's speech. We need to have a much more thoughtful conversation about what the speech's meaning is in our democracy and, and need to engage humanists, not just technologists. And so on that topic, what's your view on how Facebook has been handling management of their platform and the content, et cetera? Because they obviously uh, regularly say they're trying to not get into the censorship business, um, but there's been a lot of concern about divisiveness and hate speech and just making money out of all of this, et cetera. What's your view on how they've handled everything? Well, I think they could be better. I mean, I, I think they've come a ways. They did nothing in the beginning. Uh, and now they're at least they've got a board that's trying to advise them about content. They're trying to be more transparent. I think they need to be more transparent on some of their algorithms. I would invite some of the experts and people in on, on helping them design algorithms that may be able to identify hate speech or maybe able to identify speech. Uh, and, you know, one compromise is if, you, if there's quote unquote hate speech or people that think that there's something that's hate speech, uh, short of taking it off, you could just have a, a, algorithms that don't amplify it. And so you aren't censoring the speech, but you aren't under any obligation to uh, make that speech go viral. Uh, so I, I think that there, there's a ways to go for them. Uh, uh, they're at least uh, starting to ask questions, uh, but they can't just have this view, like I said, of anything on our platform goes and we have, uh, uh, we have uh, free speech. I mean, imagine if uh, a television station or a newspaper had taken uh, taking that view. I think they have a broader obligation to uh, democracy. Good. Excellent. Next question is from uh, and Mike Catania, one of my current students. Can you discuss the trade-offs you see between our needs for individual privacy online versus U.S. industry losing a competitive advantage to China in big data and in AI? Well, look, I mean, obviously China has an advantage in terms of having a lot of data that they can enter into these, uh, into uh, testing AI. Uh, there's a, a diminishing uh, marginal return to that data uh, at some point, uh, but, uh, you know, they have a lot more uh, data. But I, I think that over the long run, uh, you know, that's one place they have an edge, but over the long run, I think that a homogenous, relatively inhospitable society to immigration, uh, relatively uh, unfree society uh, will not win over a society uh, that is uh, as immigration and entrepreneurship and innovation. And I wouldn't compromise our uh, sense of freedoms, which is what privacy is about, not manipulating uh, individuals. What I would say is that we, where we want to compete with China is to say our free enterprise system will win, but we can't decay our infrastructure. We can't decay our uh, science and technology investments. We need to be able to uh, provide people with the basic infrastructure so that uh, they can compete. And we're not going to compete by uh, just taking everyone's data, uh, but we're going to outcompete by having more startups and more innovation and more entrepreneurship uh, and build an infrastructure foundation that's competitive. Excellent, excellent. Let me ask you a tie on to that one, COVID-19. So um, the ability to do contact tracing and quarantine and predictive capabilities of where it exists. There was just a, a Stanford uh, professor, uh, Fukuyama, I believe is his last name, that said one of the things that has been debilitating for the US in dealing with COVID-19 has been number one, a culture in the US historically that's been cynical about government. And, and a politicization about uh, issues and kind of basically this view that individual rights come first, even though you've got big public societal issues. Do you view that some of these, this area of focus of individual rights is actually in certain areas uh, harmful to the country? Well, I think that the challenge is, I mean, individual rights uh, can be very strong and they, can, they allow for uh, innovation, they allow for entrepreneurship, they allow for the critique of uh, power. I mean, the fact that uh, I, I can say Donald Trump is completely inept and incompetent in, in his response. Uh, probably people in the Communist Party can't say that about Xi Jinping. So, uh, you know, there is a lot to, to recommend it. Now, traditionally in America, obviously this is Cultural's theory, the 
individualism was checked by uh, whether it was religious institutions or community institutions or educational institutions, there were a sense of a community that would uh, temper uh, just rampant individualism. And I think we've seen the erosion of some of that. So it's one thing to say, uh, I'm individualistic and I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, listen to government mandates. And now it's another thing to say, well, I'm selfish and I'm going to go uh, get drunk at a bar or go to a beach. I mean, that's not exactly standing up for some robust sense of individualism. So I think what uh, we, we have to think about in America is how do we uh, balance our freedoms with community, but making sure those community uh, norms are not oppressive or sexist or traditional, uh, but are accounted for in modern contemporary life and accounted for in multicultural life. And that's a very tough challenge, but I would just say that uh, what we're trying to do in our country is very difficult. There's never been a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy in the history of the world. So the fact that we're not getting this fully right is, uh, is not surprising. Um, next two questions, and again, there's a total of about 25 people voted on this, uh, originally submitted by Verma Surup, um, was about antitrust. Um, seems like both political parties are complicit in allowing monopoly of big tech. Uh, Apple's app store policies equal extortion. How do you restore a level playing field? Uh, related question, what is your opinion on antitrust matters related to big tech? Should big tech companies like Apple, Facebook, and Google be broken up? Well, there should be much more antitrust law enforced. I don't, I mean, I think it depends from company to company. Uh, so I don't think uh, uh, Facebook should have been allowed to acquire WhatsApp and Instagram in the first place. And I think that there should have been uh, scrutiny there. And I think there should certainly be scrutiny on any future mergers. Now, whether they can, should disentangle them now after the government uh, already approved it, I think is a question of due process that the Justice Department would have to, uh, to do. I mean, I mean, com companies can't, you have to be entitled to a, uh, a process and the Justice Department should pursue where, where the law leads it. But what I would say, short of breaking companies up, is companies shouldn't allow to, to uh, privilege their own platforms or charge excessive rent for, in Apple's case, I don't think 30% is uh, justified. In Google's case, they shouldn't be able to privilege their own products and search. There are things we can do regulatorily uh, that Congress can do in a bipartisan way that will prevent some of the monopolization short of coming in and saying, uh, let's break Apple up or let's break Google, Google up. Good. Next question, again, a lot of votes. Um, what do you think about the Microsoft TikTok potential uh, acquisition, um, as well as Peter Navarro's suggestion on CNN that Microsoft divest its Chinese holding? Usually, if Peter Navarro says something, it means it's wrong. Um, I mean, I have very little regard for him. I mean, it's, I mean, Peter Navarro would have been wonderful as an advisor to feudal kings in the medieval ages, but he doesn't understand global supply chains. Even Trump had to contradict him because he realized he would totally lose uh, re-election of Navarro. I mean, the stock market dropped like 400 points after Navarro once said that the China, that we're no longer going to lose the China deal. Far more interesting person who I have respect for actually is Robert Lighthouser, who's, you know, still believes in a strong America industrial uh, policy and bringing manufacturing back, uh, but not in the sense that America is going to have a mercantilistic uh, war with, with China, which is uh, just not realistic. It would hurt our own uh, manufacturing, it would, uh, uh, it would be, it, it's impossible to disentangle uh, global supply chains to that extent. So what I would say is uh, what we need to do is make sure that people aren't losing IP. Uh, Microsoft, I think, if they want to acquire TikTok, that's great. We should be sensitive to, to make sure that data isn't getting, uh, getting transferred. Uh, but we, but our, our problems, in my view, are, are not the the, the, are, are not China. Our problems are insufficient investment in our own infrastructure, our own technology, our own innovation. I mean, the way we won the Cold War was we outcompeted the Soviets. We didn't uh, we didn't uh, win by by fear. We won by innovation and and, and uh, leadership. Excellent.
Excellent. Next question is um, uh, uh, here uh, on diversity. How is the government actively preparing its young citizens to be competitive in a world of AI and unicorns, especially in underserved communities? Well, I don't think we are. I think this, this idea that uh, uh, we need a digital education for everyone is, is critical and certain digital skills. I mean, not just if you want to go become uh, a tech leader or a business leader that's going to need a tech understanding for your companies, but if you want to become a writer or an entertainer or a lawmaker, uh, having some knowledge of technology is critical. And I think there's still many places that don't have high-speed internet. There's still many homes that don't have laptops. There's still many people who don't have access to computer science in their schools or digital proficiency. Uh, so uh, this divide, the digital divide, is uh, it, it is exacerbating the racial wealth gap. It's exacerbating inequities in citizenship, and it ought to be a high priority item for us to fix. Mm -hmm. Good. Next question: Fifty-four million jobs lost to COVID, yet the government uses metrics like the S and P five hundred, which tech giants carry, to justify not extending aid to the general public. How can we fix this? I completely agree with you that the uh, GDP and stock market shouldn't be the metrics to uh, look at uh, economic well-being. I'd recommend Gene Sperling has an excellent book out on economic dignity that is worth reading that talks about some of alternative measures. And then, you know, philosophically, Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen have done a lot of work on capabilities and mm -hmm. how we have to look at holistic development metrics of whether societies are doing well. Uh, do, should GDP and S&P be one metric? Yes. but it shouldn't become the, the gold standard, but this has become a cultural sense. I mean, most people, when they think of the economy, they think of the S&P, uh, they think of the Dow, that's, they think of the GDP numbers, and how we get people to think beyond that is gonna require uh, a lot of imagination and for the next president to, to, uh, uh, to really emphasize new, new metrics uh, as well. Yep, and again, related, there are several questions about unequal access to technology in the current environment of COVID-19, especially in K-12 education and maybe even higher education. What do, you, what do we do about that? Well, we might need to start with having universal broadband and, and Jim Clyburn has a great bill on that. I mean, that uh, let's have high-speed internet access to everyone. Let's, I have a bill that we're, we're gonna say that everyone should have access to a laptop. Uh, not just a laptop in your family, by the way. A lot of people have said, uh, we're talking to some of the younger black students at HBCUs, that they never had their own laptop, so they were never able to experiment, design, do a lot of things that people people do. Uh, and then we need to make sure that the, the, the schools have uh, either access to some boot camps or access to workshops or access to some computer science, but they have to be pragmatic classes because uh, a lot of the classes that are just too academic don't give you the, the industry skills that, that people are looking for. So I think that having a, uh, equitable digital education is, is, is a huge uh, need. And it's a huge opportunity because the startup costs aren't that high. You, you don't have to create new factories in places. People can work and get employment uh, whilst being thousands of miles away. And a lot of times it doesn't take more than a few months or uh, six months of credentialing to get someone an employable skill. So, while there is a huge gap, there's also a huge opportunity uh, to, to, to make that kind of investment. Mm -hmm. Related to this, the future of work. So when you look at a lot of the future areas, including areas of technology that can help society, transportation, when you have autonomous vehicles with uh, ride sharing, education, online education, the potential in many of these areas, in addition to service provision that's lower cost, is often they take jobs away. And if you look at uh, autonomous vehicles, three million truck drivers in the US. Um, if you look at virtual assistants, whatever the number might be, 15, 20 million customer service representatives. Um, what is your view about the future of work? Do you feel fundamentally that there will be a net reduction of jobs and society's got a looming issue to deal with? Or no, 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 we can redistribute. There are gonna be a bunch of new things created and don't, don't fret about this. Well, there are a lot of new things created, not just for high-end, uh, highly educated folks. Uh, there are new things. I mean, Amazon has created high, thousands of new jobs in COVID. The question is, what kind of jobs are those? And I think instead of asking the question, 
are we going to have a jobless future, which is uh, not, in my view, the likely scenario, especially with productivity still not being that high from technology according to the economic data. And uh, the, the sense, the question we should be asking is what jobs may be automated, uh, what new jobs are going to be created, and how do we make that, sure that those jobs are good paying, that they're dignified, that they uh, are uh, able to support a middle class life? So a lot of the new Amazon jobs, uh, you know, probably 40, 50,000 new jobs. I mean, I don't know the exact numbers. Uh, the question is, why are they only paying 15 bucks? I, I rely on Amazon packages. I rely on that uh, uh, very much. Why is that worker only getting that amount of money? Why are they not being able to have upward mobility? Uh, so I think that the question we ought to be asking with automation is what jobs are most at risk, what tests are most at risk, what are the new jobs, and how do we make sure all these new jobs are going to be good paying jobs? Excellent. Let me ask you one final question, and then I want to do a, a summary and see if you've got any other final uh, comments uh, for us. Your advice to the people in the audience today, many of whom are students uh, getting their MBAs, some of them are recent alums, what is your leadership advice to the to the people uh, attending today my leadership advice i i i would say um you know follow your own uh your own instincts uh, ultimately i mean listen to uh people and listen get a lot of advice get a lot of uh, perspective but ultimately if you want to do something uh you're only going to have the perseverance and tenacity to do it if it's your own uh, initiative and your own judgment. And uh, I, I would say that the people who are probably mo seemingly most likely to uh, succeed in your class probably won't be the ones who do. And sometimes it's the uh, person who's quiet and, or maybe uh, not paid attention to, uh, but uh, uh, has uh, the drive to, to succeed who, who often does. And so, uh, you know, have that inner confidence to the biggest difference, uh, the biggest privilege I think people have is uh, the people who uh, allay their doubts and, and, and give them self-confidence and belief. And I would surround myself with people who do that for you, who, who uh, err on the side of overestimating your abilities than underestimating them. Excellent. Good. Let me do this, Congressman, if I can. I always try and summarize what I took away from your messages, and I want to give you a chance to hear those and upgrade them as appropriate. <laughs> if, you have, if you have no upgrades, then you can share your other party. No, I wish the press would do that with me. You know, here's what you said. <laughs> now you tell me how you, you want to edit it. This is a much easier, friendlier environment here than, uh, than with the media, I'm sure. Um, so I got four kind of key takeaways uh, here. Um, number one is the power of technology, but the technology, technology companies and technology leaders have to be well managed. There's got to be a thoughtfulness in the products, the services, the impact, et cetera, that this isn't just something you kind of let run and whatever happens, happens. That's the first message I got. The second message I got in the midst of all of the tech lash issues the key message I got from you about the most critical one is the digital divide. That at the core of everything, if people are feeling disenfranchised, economically not doing well, you get a whole host of things that just undermine society. And so there's kind of a Maslow's hierarchy here, and you gotta solve that issue well before you uh, move on to the other uh, items. The third uh, message I've got is about the quote unquote behavior of business that business leaders need to be quote unquote well behaved. And I think your argument is they need to be the leaders of business, but they also need to be the leaders of their communities. That the idea that um, there should be more kind of self-policing, that's an important thing to do, but it's not gonna be just that, that you're gonna need to know that there's gonna be some public policy intervention, there's gonna be some government intervention, and you need to realize you're part of a broader community and you need to act accordingly. So I got that as the, uh, 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 the next one. And then the, the final piece here is your last message on leadership is have a set of things that you feel strongly about and go act on those things. Don't let uh, the, the conveniences of the moment uh, sway you in what you're trying to get, uh, get done. Did I capture your message as well? Anything you would, uh, you would add or take no, away? No, I thought that was, that was really great. I appreciate your paying such close attention. I would just say that uh, 
you know, I obviously I prioritize the the economic, uh, but there are other people who may prioritize other aspects of it. So I I'd encourage you to to you know make those determinations uh, on your own. But I will say, I guess I'd end with saying that uh, I fundamentally believe technology is transforming every aspect of our economy and underneath every aspect of of, of society and the uh, a, a need to understand it, the need to be able to shape it, the need to be able to thoughtfully uh, regulate it uh, are the biggest questions of uh, 21st century governance. So I appreciate that uh, uh, you're engaged in this conversation and we need thoughtful voices uh, to help guide us. Excellent, excellent. Well, let me just uh, close with several uh, thank yous. So, Congressman, I wanted to start with you. A huge thank you. In a very short period of time, it's very clear you've thought a lot about all of these issues. And it's very helpful to have somebody bring all this together and have a higher order about what leadership is all about. And given this is our inaugural event, it's especially helpful that, that you did that and you're speaking with us. I'm honored. Uh, I'm honored you'd select me for your inaugural event. Absolutely, absolutely. And let me thank also the centers at Anderson. I want to thank the Center for Global Management and Lucy Allard, who's been a key partner in making this happen. I want to thank the Easton Center, the Technology Management Center for their role. Uh, Congressman, again, a huge thank you, and we'll look forward to more time with you and, uh, and everybody else. Take care. Sounds great. Thank you very much.